thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm here today to talk about diversity in science and why diversity makes science not just fairer, but better. This past year, we've all been grappling with issues of the challenge of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in science in particular, we faced profound challenges. Now, before talking about the difficulty, I think it is worth looking back to acknowledge that in many professions and institutions, we've made enormous progress. The advancement of women in professional fields provides some historical examples and context. If we look at medicine in the 19th century, in the United States, there were actually separate medical colleges for women. So America practiced a kind of apartheid, a separate and unequal medical education for women. And this was justified, allegedly scientifically, on the basis that women were simply unable to withstand the physical rigors of a tough medical education. If we look at law, we see a similar pattern. Law schools didn't have separate law schools for women, they just generally excluded them. For most of the 19th and early 20th century, women were excluded from most top law schools, or if they were included, they were marginalized. Everyone is familiar with the career of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who made it all the way to the US Supreme Court. This photograph shows Ruth Bader Ginsburg with her Harvard Law Review group in 1957-58. Ginsburg was one of only two women in that group, and you can see in this photograph that they are literally marginalized. The women are physically put at the margins of the photograph. Now, that was in the 1950s. Today, things are much better. Women now make up more than 50% of the students in top law schools across the country, and the same is true in medical schools as well. If we look at politics, we also see a pattern of really tremendous progress. In the 19th century, there were no women in the US Congress, and in the 20th century, the first woman elected to Congress was Representative Jeanette Rankin, who for most of her career was the only woman to serve in the House of Representatives. The situation in the Senate was not much better. For most of the tw early 20th century, there was only one or two women in the Senate, and typically they were appointed upon the death of either their husband or their father. Hattie Carraway was the first woman appointed in such a way to actually run in her own uh, in her own regard. And when she did run after having been initially elected, people criticized her tremendously. The expectation was that she was supposed to simply step down. And so she said, the time has passed when a woman should be placed in a position and kept there only while someone else is being groomed for the job. Jeanette Rankin, looking back on her career said, if I had my life to do over, I would do it all again, but this time I would be nastier. If we look at the big picture of Congress, we see a huge change starting around the 1990s, where suddenly there's an enormous increase in the representation of women. And we can see this in these photographs here. The upper photographs is Lyndon Baines Johnson with the 90th Congress. You can see it's all men, almost entirely in black and gray suits. But when we get to the 116th Congress, now we have many women bringing not just their talents and diversity, but much more colorful and fun clothing as well. Now today, few people would openly argue against diversity in political representation, but there's still a lot of resistance to purposefully expanding diversity in science. The two main arguments that are generally used to support diversity and inclusion in the scientific workplace are fairness and talent. People acknowledge that it's simply not fair to exclude talented people from opportunity, and it's grossly unfair to subject them to harassment, discrimination, or a hostile workplace. If we exclude people on the basis of race, gender, or other demographic criteria, we also lose talent, and so science suffers. And in my experience, those two arguments are generally broadly accepted. But these arguments sit in tension with something else going on. Many people in science do argue against purposeful diversity because of what they call their commitment to excellence. Most scientists believe that science is a meritocracy, that the best man wins. But unfortunately, this is generally literally true. The best man wins, but that might not be the best person. They see the goal of inclusion and diversity, therefore, in tension or at odds with the goal of excellence. They perceive a tension between attempts to make science more inclusive and the necessity of maintaining the highest intellectual standards. 
and for many people in science, the latter trumps the former. This is reflected in reports like this one, Pursuing Excellence on a Foundation of an Inclusion, that was issued by my own university, Harvard, which is clearly trying to reassure the Harvard community that we can pursue inclusion without sacrificing excellence. In other words, acknowledging this idea that there's a tension between the two. But I want to argue today that this framing has the problem backwards, that it's not just that we can pursue diversity without sacrificing excellence, it's that we cannot have scientific excellence without diversity. So how do I support that claim? Well, first, let's talk about the goal of science. What is the goal of science? The answer, to find out truths about the natural world. How do scientists do that? Well, not the scientific method, as I've argued in my books and in my previous TED Talk, there is no one scientific method. But what all scientists have in common is that they collect evidence in the field, in the laboratory, in clinical trials, through animal studies, by building models. And then this evidence is vetted. All scientific disciplines have processes for vetting claims in workshops, conferences, informal colleague review, formal peer review, the continued evaluation of work in practice, and sometimes where necessary, retraction. Scientific claims are subject to tough critical scrutiny. You have to be thick skinned to be a scientist. The process is not always fun, but it is essential for two reasons. The process of critical vetting weeds out faulty or unsupported claims. And through discussion and criticism, claims are modified and knowledge emerges. Knowledge is established. The philosopher of science, Helen Longino, calls this transformative interrogation. Interrogation because it's tough, but transformative because what survives is typically not the same as what was at the starting point. Scientists adjust their claims in light of critical scrutiny. Sometimes they go back and collect more or different data. Sometimes they conclude that the original idea was no good and they have to start all over again. What we call scientific facts are claims that have withstood this scrutiny. So, how does that bring us to diversity? Well, to understand why diversity is crucial for the success of this scientific process, we have to say something about objectivity. Now, many people think that science works because scientists are objective. And certainly it's true that all good scientists try as much as possible to be objective. We can say that objectivity is what philosophers call a regulative ideal, something that we aspire to. Now, most people think of objectivity as a characteristic that inheres in the individual. So we might say things like, I am objective, she is not objective, or a good scientist is objective. Typical definitions of objectivity insist that it's based on observation, but not influenced by emotions or prejudices. So for example, one popular definition, judgment based on observable phenomena and uninfluenced by emotions or personal prejudices. Objectivity is associated with empirical observation as opposed to feelings, emotions, or other thought processes. But various scholars say not so fast because the opposite of objectivity isn't bias, it's subjectivity. And we are all subjective because all perception is subjective. So we could make the distinction, and many people do, between objective facts and subjective opinions. So this slide gives two examples. Here's an objective fact. The Force Awakens is the highest grossing Star Wars movie. Here's a subjective opinion. The Empire F Strikes Back is the best Star Wars movie. Or consider this one. These are oranges. I love oranges. The problem is that the standard distinction between an objective fact and a subjective opinion breaks down when we look closely at the problem of perception. So consider this slide. Three people all look at the exact same object. They all see it with their eyes in the same way. Nobody's colorblind. And yet their perceptions of this object are very different. And all three of these perceptions, including that you could make money by cutting down the tree and selling it, they're all right, but they're different. 
Different people can look at the same thing and have different perceptions of it. Here's another perhaps clearer example. Let's go back to those oranges. Are we really sure they're oranges? How do we know they're not tangerines or clementines or plastic fruit? Or how about this one? Is it a six or is it a nine? What all this adds up to is that people necessarily see things in different ways. It doesn't mean they're bad or good or that one person is objective and the other is biased. It just means that we're human beings. So let's take the famous example of the six blindfolded people and the elephant. In this classic metaphor, we, we understand the metaphor to tell us that if we relied on only one report, we'd get a very wrong impression of what this thing is. At best, we would have a true but partial account. But now imagine that the blindfolds are taken off. And even if the people were not blindfolded, if they were all looking from the same angle, what we would obtain would be a partial perspective. So we might see the front of the elephant, but not the back. We wouldn't know how long the creature was. We wouldn't know whether or not it had a tail. And this then explains why it's crucial, why diversity is crucial to see the whole picture of the natural world, to find out the truth about the natural world. Because scientists are humans who invariably and inevitably bring their own values, preferences, bias, and prior experiences into their work. So the best available way to correct for that is by having diverse scientists who can assure then that problems are examined from a range of different and appropriate perspectives. We all have different experiences, but in science, the goal is not to end up with your truth and my truth, but to end up with truth. And so a diverse community isn't just politically correct, it's more likely to generate scientific claims that are actually correct. And isn't that what we want? <laughs>